Welcome back to my series on Dire Straits and welcome also to all the new subscribers who have come on board since I made my last video. It's not something I expected to happen but uh, thank you very much, it's, it's much appreciated. So today we're going to look at my personal favourite Dire Straits album released in September 1991, their final album On Every Street. Absolutely wonderful album full of uh, fantastic songs brilliantly recorded. Uh, this one was uh, recorded uh, over the course of uh, a fairly extended period of time, uh, around about uh, sort of autumn 90 into mid-1991 at uh, Air Studios in Oxford Street, London. I think this was before they moved to, to the location where they are now. Um, now, there is a possibility, I believe, that Brothers in Arms might have been the last Dire Straits album. Um, but I think what happened was that um, when the band played at the Nasa Mandela 70th birthday tribute concert in uh, 88, uh, it sort of gave Mark the, the, the taste to, to make some more music and go out and, and play some more shows with Dire Straits, and that eventuated in On Every Street a few years later. Um, the official members of the band by this stage were just four of them. You, you had Mark himself, you had uh, John Elsley, uh, so they were the two original members uh, who were with the band right from the start, uh, Guy Fletcher and Alan Clark. And uh, in many ways it could be argued that by this stage uh, Dire Straits was a, a sort of a trading name for Mark Knopfler. Uh, it was in, in, in many ways a sort of a, a vehicle for his, for his songs. There were some new personnel involved in the recording of On Every Street as well. Uh, Terry Williams, who uh, had played drums for the band throughout most of the 80s, had played his last gig with Dire Straits at that NASA Mandela show in, in 1988. Uh, and so he was replaced on the album uh, by Jeff Porcaro, uh, a fantastic drummer who played uh, drums with Toto. And he was a terrific addition uh, to, to the lineup for the album. His drums just sounded fantastic on every street. I think I think his drums are a really important element of this album. Um, you had Phil Palmer, uh, who played uh, some additional guitar parts on the album. Uh, Chris White, who had uh, played saxophone with Dire Straits since the Brothers in Arms tour, made his first studio appearance with Dire Straits on this album. Um, who else was there? There was Danny Cummings, who played percussion on the album, and he became quite a significant contributor to, Mark, to Mark's work over the years, um, eventually becoming his, his drummer uh, into his solo career. Um, and also Paul Franklin played pedal steel on the album and also joined the band on the tour. So that was an interesting addition to, to the Dire Straits lineup because they'd never had a, a pedal steel player uh, in any of their lineups previously. Um, another significant um, addition to the personnel for On Every Street was uh, a chap called uh, Chuck Ainley. Uh, Chuck Ainley was the engineer on this album um, and he went on to become Mark's co-producer um, for uh, quite a significant chunk of his solo career. Uh, he produced all of Mark's albums from Golden Heart up to and including Privateering, uh, one of the very, very best in the business and um, he really uh, he really knows how to make records, does Chuck. And um, he tells a great story, actually, uh, in the uh, EPK for the Shangri-La album, Mark's fourth solo album, that uh, he was called um, by Dire Straits to ask if, if, if he would like to be involved in the production of their next album. Uh, but he thought it was a hoax, he thought it was just a nuisance call, and he said, no, I'm really busy right now, he just, he just put the phone down on him, and uh, he said that he, he got home and his wife told him, his wife said to him, did, did Dire Straits call you earlier on? And he thought, oh shit, so <laughs> I love that story, but uh, thankfully it all got worked out and he became the engineer on, on every street and, and subsequently became a significant contributor to Mark's uh, solo work. Musically, the album marked a move towards more conventional, perhaps more traditional kinds of songs. Um, the kinds of songs that we've perhaps become more familiar with into Mark's solo career. Uh, firstly, there are more of them, 
Uh, there are more tracks on, on every street than there are on any of the previous Dire Straits albums. And there are no massive kind of epics on there like um, Telegraph Road or um, It Never Rains or, or any of that kind of thing. The songs are, are structured perhaps more conventionally than, than um, some of the stuff you'll find on Love of a Gold or, or even Brothers in Arms. And um, I think some of the influence for the songs would have come from uh, the work that Mark did with the Notting Hill Billies and indeed um, Chad Atkins on, on the Neck and Neck album. And so he's, he's becoming a bit more kind of rootsy in, in his approach to, to writing the songs. Though whilst the songs are rootsier than what we were familiar with on previous Dire Straits albums, uh, production-wise it's a relatively high-tech kind of recording, for want of a better description. Uh, you've got some really lovely sounding uh, synth pads on there, uh, and it's, it's a very polished kind of production. It's not overproduced, uh, but it's, it's a very neat, tidy, and very, very listenable um, kind of production. So let's go through some of the songs on the album, and the opener, also its lead single, and really Dire Straits' last significantly big hit, was Calling Elvis. This is the 12 inch edition of the single. And um, there's a great B side on here as well, actually, called uh, Millionaire Blues, uh, which is really good fun. Um, some, uh, some really good, sort of tongue in cheek lyrics on there. So it's, it's well worth checking down a, a copy of that uh, single if you haven't got it already. Uh, but Calling Elvis itself um, is a kind of a shuffle, and it's got this sort of twiddly guitar solo in the middle of it, which is, I think was a significant contributor to why that song was a hit. Um, it's, it's one of those elements of a song that that's, you'll remember the most, you know, the after the first time you hear it. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the signature element of the song. Um, and it was a very effective album opener. It was also a very effective set opener. Um, it was the opener throughout the Oliver Street tour in a significantly extended form. Um, and it remained a set staple in, in Dire Straits and Mark's shows over the course of the next uh, decade or so. The second track on the album is uh, On Every Street, the title track, which uh, is a kind of a piano orientated ballad. Um, it's almost kind of anthemic actually, that song. And, um, but probably the most striking aspect of that song is its outro. Uh, the drums gradually sort of build up to the full band coming in and uh, this repeating uh, guitar riff uh, as the song fades out. It's very effective and uh, was very good to hear live as well. And it's been, it's been fantastic to hear that track live on Mark's last couple of tours, um, the track of tour and the uh, Down the Road Forever tour. Uh, it, it's a song that, that's more than worthy of being in the set, and so it's, it's been really good to hear that one live again uh, over the past few years. Um, so then the third track is When It Comes To You. Now that's a song that was actually played live by the Notting Hillbillies um, on their UK tour in 1990. Uh, and it was a slightly different kind of version. It, it, it was It was... A more uh, bluegrassy sort of version, for want of a better description, whereas the um, the version on on every street um, is a, a more straightforward kind of pop rock song, uh, where Mark's using an, an overdriven guitar tone on his uh, penza, um, and there's a there's a great uh, synth pad on there, which really gives the song atmosphere and and. Um, I'm a sucker for a good synth pad. <laughs> it's, uh, that's one of the things that I like most about that song. Um, and uh, some, some great uh, sort of gruff vocals from Mark on there as well. Um, so that's when it comes to you. We have uh, Fate of Black, um, which is very, very bluesy um, and features Mark uh, playing his uh, Gibson Super 400, which is a guitar with a huge body which almost um, when you played it live it almost covered Mark's entire body <laughs> it was a it was a big um, big uh, guitar with a big rich tone and and, um, and so that features on Fate of Black and uh, that's a, a great slice of blues and then we have uh, we have the bug which was Dire Straits last single and that one um, 
is it's just massive fun. It has a it has a memorable chorus, uh, a great melody. Um, it's um, it's one of the brightest songs that Dire Straits recorded, I think. And uh, it was always good fun live. It was slightly extended live with a um, hugely impressive guitar solo from Mark. Um, I mean, it, it, the amazing thing. I mean, if, when you watch. Mark play that guitar solo on the, the on the night DVD. Um, you know it's it's a furious solo. I mean he's really going at it, and and yet, you know he's he doesn't seem to need to put any effort into it. You know it's just completely effortless, um, and it's it's hugely impressive. And, and that was one of the things that that um, made me realise what a hugely talented guitar player Mark is. Uh, the ability to to play these incredible guitar solos. Um, uh, while seemingly still having plenty left in the tank, you know, he's, he's, he's just a, a remarkable, remarkable guitar player, uh, goes without saying, of course. So, um, the next track is You and Your Friend, again, a kind of a bluesy song. Um, and um, this is a song about uh, jealousy. You know, jealousy is a nasty emotion, but it makes great subject matter for songs. <laughs> and uh, You and Your Friend is a very good example. So uh, next we had Heavy Fuel, uh, which I suppose is kind of on every street's money for nothing. Uh, it's, it's got a great overdriven guitar riff and uh, uh, it didn't have the impact of money for nothing. It, it was a single. Um, it was, uh, I believe, the second single from the album. Here is the 12-inch uh, the single. That is a character from the music video for Heavy Fuel. Because uh, the song is is about living the sort of hamburger lifestyle, uh, as Mark put it, um, constantly living on the edge. And uh, the uh, CD single was very interesting because it took the shape of a hamburger uh, with the little three-inch CD inside, providing the filling. <laughs> that's one of my favourite um, Martin Offer Dire Straits items that and it's got a great B-side on there called uh, Kingdom Come an absolute belter of a track that's, that's another outtake from the uh, On Every Street sessions so that's um, Heavy Fuel uh, what was the next track? Uh, Iron Hand the Iron Hand is a sort of um, uh, it's, it's kind of a, an acoustic folk song. It, it's one of these songs that would work very well um, just as, as a, a voice guitar uh, performance. Um, but the, the recording, uh, whilst uh, it is predominantly guitar vocal, uh, it's, it's got some really rich uh, synth pads in there and, and uh, percussive effects which really give the song a lot of depth. The soundscape of that song is fantastic. Uh, it's probably one of my favorites on the album. Mark has talked about bringing that song back into the set in recent years, um, but uh, for whatever reason, it, it hasn't happened yet. Um, but um, lyrically also, it's, it's terrific. Um, uh, it, it's, it's actually quite profound, uh, you know, we haven't changed since ancient times. That that last that last line it has quite a lot of impact. Um, so that's um, Iron Hand, and then we have Ticket to Heaven, which is a kind of a '60s style ballad, um, and this one featured uh, a string arrangement by George Martin. Uh, and the the song is a I think it's a kind of a dig at TV evangelists, which um, I think were, were big at the time and. Um, and it's it's a very sad song actually because the character in the song has been kind of taken in by all this nonsense and and uh, he's he's given all his money away to the man with the diamond ring as as the, as the song puts it and he hasn't got enough money for basic necessities you know and and uh, so um, that's um, that's a sad song but uh, a very beautiful song as well that however gives way to my parties which. Um, is rather more tongue in cheek, and uh, uh, not everybody likes this one, but I, I love it. I, I think it's it's great fun. I love the horns on it. Um, I love the the again the synth pads on it. it that's one of the things that characterises this characterises this album is is these these, these synth pads that that uh, give it so much atmosphere. Um, 
particularly when the song breaks down before the final uh, outro and, and, and fade out. And this song does actually have a, a, a certain depth of meaning to it because it kind of deals with with people who live irresponsible lifestyles um, in an effort to keep up with the Joneses, um, as it were. And, um, and uh, it's got some great sort of tongue-in-cheek lyrics in there. Um, it's getting a trifle colder, step inside my home as a brass toilet tissue holder with its own telephone. <laughs> it's, I, I, I love that. I, that gave me a good laugh when I first heard it. Uh, it still makes me giggle now. Um, so uh, I, I love my parties. I think it's I think it's really good fun, and I'm glad that it made it onto the album. I, I know it's not popular with everybody, but uh, I love it. Um, the next track is uh, Planet of New Orleans. Now, Planet of New Orleans uh, is probably the closest the album comes to having a sort of an epic. I mean, it's not uh, epic to the proportions of, of a Telegraph Road, but it's, um, it's, it's the closest on every street will come to that. Um, and it's a song which kind of builds up over, over the course of it. Uh, and it starts off with this kind of semi-improvised guitar solo that Mark plays on his, um, on his Penza and some uh, almost kind of whispered vocals um, and some interesting lyrical imagery on there. Um, and that's, it's just a very, very strong track. Um, and uh, they didn't actually play it live regularly on the tour, uh, which is perhaps a bit of a surprise considering how strong that song is. Um, but it's, it's one of the high points of the album. There, there can be no question about that. And then uh, again, I, I think um, uh, How Long, the, the last track on the album, like Planet of New Orleans, is, is very well placed. Um, because it's it's kind of light-hearted and um, uh, it, it is kind of strangely heartwarming, even though lyrically it isn't. Um, and I, I love the fade out of the song when you get this um, exchange of solos between Mark on his Les Paul and, and Paul Franklin on, on pedal steel. Um, uh, because you you almost kind of get the feeling that it's Dire Straits kind of walking off into the distance because this is the last original song that we heard from, from Dire Straits. Um, and I think it's a, a wonderful end to what is a, a really wonderful album with an amazing kind of soundscape. And the, the album feels like a farewell. Now, whether, whether that was intentional or not, I don't know, um, but... Uh, I, I think they knew this was going to be the last album, but whether it was actually designed to, to kind of say farewell, I, I, I don't know. But, but uh, the um, overarching thing with, with On Every Street is that it, it is an amazing sounding album to this day. I mean, it's, it's one of these albums that, that you could record in precisely the same way now and yet it would not sound outdated. It's, it has a timeless quality to it. At the time that the album was released, uh, the critics uh, saw it as a kind of an underwhelming follow-up to Brothers in Arms, um, which um, of course is complete nonsense. I mean, Mark wasn't writing a, or recording a follow-up to, to Brothers in Arms. It was just the next album. Um, but uh, I mean, one of the inherent problems with uh, with having an album as successful as Brothers in Arms is that everybody expects you to, to kind of repeat it the next time. Uh, they expect you to do a sort of a Brothers in Arms Mark II um, and to, you know, achieve the same success with it. Um, I mean, a similar thing happened with Fleet with Max Rumours back in 77 or whenever that was released. Everybody was expecting a Rumours Mark II, but they came out with Tusk, which was a whole other kettle of fish and was much more kind of left of the palate and was not nearly as successful. Uh, a similar sort of thing happened with, with On Every Street um, because everybody was expecting Brothers in Arms 2. Uh, but, uh, I mean, Mark had moved on. Mark had moved on as a musician. He had taken on new influences uh, from working with Nelson Hillbillies and Chet Atkins. Uh, you know, and, and you've got to move on as a musician. You, you can't just stay in the same place all the time or you'll, you'll never evolve. Um, so... On Every Street was, was, was just where Mark was at that time in, in his career.
And it is true that On Every Street didn't sell as well as Brothers in Arms, but uh, you know, you're know you comparing it to one of the, the most iconic albums of all time. Uh, and Brothers in Arms sold in, in stupendous numbers. You know, it sold 30 million copies. Um, on Every Street sold uh, only half that amount. But in its own right, it was still hugely successful. Uh, it was still a number one and was still very popular. Um, um, and uh, yeah, spawned at least one you know, fairly big hit. Um, but uh, whatever the case, none of that matters. I mean, the, the fact is that, that On Every Street is just a really strong album. I think a very special album. Um, and it was the perfect way for Dire Straits to say farewell.